Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I have the distinct pleasure of talking to Kurt Wookert and Matthew John of Crypto Traders Pro. Uh, how's it going, guys? Pretty good. How you doing, Joel? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, we kind of know each other for a little while. And one thing that's stuck out is that we, in this world of crypto being very much about trading and speculation and things like that, you guys seem to be some of the people who have gravitated the most towards the adoption based things as in fundamentals who's using it where are they using it how easy is it for people to use all the good stuff that i care about which it's it's an odd world where i'm actually surprised when someone else sort of shares that point of view <laughs> so um how did you guys first get involved in uh, cryptocurrency how did you and why why do you even care uh i'll start uh, so for me, I was a uh, just a serious libertarian activist. I was uh, anti-central bank. I, I was a Ron Paul, uh, like on the street door knocker kind of guy in 2004. I was in college. I think it was 2004. Uh, and then again in 2008. And then uh, somebody told me about Bitcoin in 2012. I don't remember who, but uh, I just kind of got involved in that. At first I thought it was like, ah, oh, this is digital fiat. It's, it's garbage. but uh, then um, yeah, just got myself all tangled into it. Read the white paper and and just got really into into it for fundamental reasons. For the same reason, I was a libertarian activist and a gold bug and everything else. So, so the whole uh, Roger Veer Avenue. It basically, yeah, pretty similar uh, backstory there. Except I did not start as a successful entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, most of us don't. <laughs> yeah. So the way I started, I think is. Uh, Pretty unique. A lot of people like this story. Um, I actually placed a $500 bet on Donald Trump becoming president. And that was on a website that had the option of taking your winnings out in a check or Bitcoin. And originally I tried the check, but it said it would take two to four weeks. And I'm like, all right, I don't want to wait this long. I heard the word Bitcoin. I knew it existed. I just didn't know much about it but it said it would pay out instantly. So I took that risk and I just said, all right, I'm getting the Bitcoin. And this was in 2016, right after Trump won. And since then I've been trading. And prior to this, I was trading stocks since 2012. And uh, I already had that trading experience. So I figured out there's Bitcoin, then I found Ethereum and kind of just grew from there. So you kind of jumped in from a trader's perspective as far as expertise, but it was it was that no nonsense, no old legacy fee, all that friction that was like, well, you can have that friction or you can just zap and now you got it. And that's kind of what, what hooked you, huh? Yeah, I, I, I saw it as a really good opportunity because um, I was paying attention to the charts and actually trying to learn about it. When a lot of people, they come into the market, and they don't have the traders background. So they don't really know, oh, there's charts for this and you could analyze the market. I felt I had an edge and there's not a lot of traders, like professional traders coming into the markets yet. So I felt like I had an edge and I really took that and ran. Yeah, sort of like the second coming of Tone Vase. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get that one in there. <laughs> yeah, so. As far as like the adoption thing, obviously, Kurt, you've been into that thing since day one. Yeah. And what are some of the biggest inspirations you've seen with that kind of thing? Because I'm sure everyone's like, oh, yeah, gold, silver, we can use those kinds of things are better than government money, et cetera. And like, what was the kind of what were some of the things that saw and inspired you to actually, you know, give a hoot about getting this magic Internet money used by average people? and actually like spend some time on it. So in about 20 or 2008, I started working on a, a, a business plan with a buddy and we were talking about how to do what is now today we think of as like tokenization. But what I was working on uh, and the reason we didn't end up doing it was because the logistics really sucked. But I was talking mm -hmm. about like, hey, what if we were to give point of sale systems to to stores and allow them to accept anything as money. So if you could do, like if I could pay in salt or silver or, or copper or whatever I wanted to, 
and just have a basic weight and measure system that used QR codes uh, to create a fiat value for whatever was there at the time. And the logistics were a nightmare, but it was an idea that I had because I liked the idea of, of beating up fiat money however I could. So we were trying to think of a creative way to, to give people the tools to do it. Ultimately, we, we ran into way too many problems because you know, who, who's gonna be the central processor? Who's like, how's the network gonna be maintained? Like it, it was a nightmare to do privately. And then the centralization aspect obviously would open us up to all kinds of uh, problems. But uh, that buddy of mine, we're still friends. And it's funny because I, I met with him about a month and a half ago to talk about Bitcoin again and explain tokenization to him. He's like, oh my God, like that's the thing. And um, but yeah, at the time, like I, it was just like the tools weren't there, but I, I like the idea of not being forced to use fiat, like debt notes. I, I think it's a, it's an aspect of our, our soft slavery that I've always mm -hmm. wanted to kind of just get away from for the sake of protest. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm a contrarian. I really, really dislike authority as a rule. And, um, yeah, just trying to be creative. So Bitcoin, like once I understood what Bitcoin was, I was instantly like, bam, that's the thing. It needs to be used as money. We need to replace fiat. And, and yeah. that was that. It's all history from there. And how are you with BTC right now? Are you, you all best buddies? <laughs> no, not exactly. The uh, Actually, in my opinion, I, I think the community is, is plainly toxic. Um, I, I think they've become the elitist. They're the new too big to fail. Uh, and quite frankly, they're jerks. Like the main, the main spokespeople that you think of when you think of Bitcoin, if you try to have a rational conversation about why something might not work or why something in the BTC roadmap might be a bad idea, like it, it won't be discussed. It can't be discussed. You're instantly, like it, it's like there's a, you know, laugh everyone off the, off the island kind of situation where it's like point fingers, laugh, block, permaban everywhere. And it's like, Man, you guys, uh, for being a decentralized, open community, are, are are pretty pretty damn toxic, in my opinion. Yeah, it's odd timing because just today I saw um, someone shared a screenshot of a tweet from Brenna Sparks, who's <laughs> an adult actress and yeah. known crypto promoter, yeah. saying how she's basically didn't want to promote crypto anymore because of how toxic and nasty all these people have been to her and like right. i don't know anything about her work in let especially not in the like the crypto space i just kind yeah. of seen mentions pop up sure and it's just but it, it's like it's not one of those oh my gosh what happened it's one of those yep another one bites the dust kind of attitudes right. crystal clear yeah oh. so i noticed uh i remember way back when we first started talking um there seems to be a little bit of evolution since then pardon the pun in the way you get you have a perceived dash mm -hmm. i remember it because there's a million coins under the sun yeah. most of them are not good and obviously it's easy to just get swept swept up in you know all hey, right whatever i'm i remain skeptical what mm -hmm. kind of like softened your skepticism on that um actually well, a lot of research, you know, I remember. Oh, I remember wow. Like, Someone that looks into stuff and doesn't just run their mouth and call everything yeah. a shit coin. They, okay. To I'm be surprised. Fair, so to be fair, I was, you know, I bought the narrative of, you know, I don't like X coin or dark coin, like that whole thing, like the, mm -hmm. the pre mine, all, all the stuff, all the, all the, the basic dashes of scam kind of narratives. I just, I just listened to because the people who I trusted the were, you know, that was the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but then I came to realize, first of all, Dash has been around for a long time. Uh, can yeah. continue a couple weeks coming up on five years. Yeah. Just saying. And, and that's, and that's relevant, right? You know, yeah. and I think, I think even if like, let's assume Evan created it for nefarious purposes. I think mm -hmm. even if that was the case, it doesn't matter at this point. Because the, the, the decentralization of the project has continued to grow, the development has continued to grow, the adoption, the community, everything else, um, it's clear that the people that have the most influence in Dash care about Dash actually being a coin for mass adoption. It's not some pump and dump or I'm going to create my coin and dump it on everybody's ass. And 
I, I, it, I mean, it just speaks for itself at this point. And, and so all of the, the FUD that, you know, surrounds it as a, as a community and everything else, I, I just, I think it's irrelevant at this point. It's like talking about, well, you know, the, you know, the United States was founded as a, as a colony by Freemasons and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's fine. Like all, like all of that's irrelevant at this point. I'll never forgive them for going off the Articles of Confederation. Well, I'm sure exactly. that I've heard that a yes. couple times actually. That's, and that's exactly the point. Is is that you know what? Whatever X coin or Dark coin or whatever could have been there at this point is pretty irrelevant to where Dash is today. And it's clearly a community that cares about mass adoption and is putting its money where its mouth is. And and that should matter to everybody more than anything else. Well, I mean, that's why I kind of got in the game. And I, as much as I got my, my racehorse blinders on that, I'm just, I'm focused on the one thing I think can fo- help the world the most. I'm starting to try to widen horizons to remain objective. Yeah. Like for example, <laughs> last night I was, as I was trying to go to sleep and unsuccessfully, I was scrolling through researching uh, Stellar's consensus mm-hmm. system because people are oh, Stellar or the great this, that I'm like, kind of sounds like a ripple and I'm kind of not, yeah. But I want to I want to know what it's about, and then I'm saying, okay, well, how does this? How do we guarantee that this is a decentralized consensus mechanism? I start looking through. I'm still kind of unconvinced, but I'm I'm looking. I'm I'm not so- sure. waiting for everyone to just talk smack and say, oh, same thing with Ripple too. I'm mm-hmm. not hanging around saying, oh, Bankster scam coin, and just that's it. It's like they, you have to have a reason, and so I'm kind of, I don't talk a lot about Ripple other than yeah, as like a, a crypto insider reference. Just because I don't have I don't have intelligent arguments yet, sure. either way, and so speaking of polarizing things that people have not done anywhere near enough research on, yeah. let's talk about uh, Bitcoin SV, sure, or Bitcoin Craig Wright. <laughs> <laughs> How's um? I remember you guys being into Bitcoin Cash, mm-hmm. and I mean that seems like a very reasonable point of view mm-hmm. as anyone who's into the old Bitcoin, especially someone who at that point is still thinking that Evan Duffield scammed everyone into prosperity or whatever. <laughs> it's still like, I understand that not being on the radar. Um, it's been interesting to see which people have split mm-hmm. to the ABC camp and the SV camp. And it seems like you guys fell pretty, pretty solidly in the SV camp from like day one. Or yeah. pretty much, like right away. Is there anything specifically that turned you on about SV or turned you off about the ABC people? I mean, obviously, there's. Let's not make this about the back and forth of oh well, this they said that person when this person scammed that like just some right. like the main principles like the sure. the objective selling points kind of. I I think for me it's it's very simple actually. You know, I'm not I'm not hyper technical. I I I know I know what I like about the network and consensus mechanisms, all that. I understand the limitations that are there, but you know, some of this stuff is is all theory, right? And and no coin has actually established itself as the the king of anything. Like, you know, even the you know, BTC is not used by one percent of the economy anywhere. So it's, you know, the adoption stuff, all of that is kind of irrelevant to who should win in, in like a fundamental sense. But if you look at Bitcoin Cash and and what Bitcoin was and the white paper and everything else, like Bitcoin SV is attempting to be the Bitcoin of the white paper. And at the very least, you know, everything else aside, I want to see if that works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But we have progressive projects. We have, you know, Dash trying out masternodes and privacy and built-in stuff. And then we've got like Digibyte trying five algorithms and multi shield and all these and you know and then we've got a dozen other coins that really are trying to do very progressive things with their network and i think that's all great like at some point some of these things can be integrated into the great you know the great winner you know that could be generations away frankly but you know btc clearly doesn't want to do anything but their own thing bch I liked the idea that they wanted to be the Bitcoin of the white paper and let's just continue to adopt and scale up. But then all of a sudden, all of the stuff about avalanche pre-consensus and all these different things like, okay, well, that's not like, that's not really trying the white paper anymore. And, um, 
Although, you know, maybe it is the right thing to do because I, I frankly don't know. Uh, and then Bitcoin SV, the, the ethos is, is l like, let's see if Satoshi was right. Because for the love of God, nobody else actually wants to see if Satoshi was right about 10 minute block time and SHA-256 and, you know, all, all the basics, all the fundamentals of Bitcoin. So that's... Yeah, so it does sort of make sense with the um, <laughs> BTC, like Bitcoin failing, as it were. Mm hmm when it it didn't fail it just it changed and that didn't work out right and um i do that is sort of to someone who has a lot more i guess i don't really give a who you know it's a free market right I, everything can be but someone who's been more familiar with people on the abc side mm -hmm. i do definitely concede that um if you're trying to compete as far as uh, uh the best digital cash in the world Mm -hmm. I kind of think Dash has the the edge over in terms of progressive, um, you know, just just fixing all the old problems or sure. trying new things, trying to streamline things. So if the if the print in the field of just stark raven originalism, <laughs> it is kind of a. I do see how the uh, that SV thing has kind of gotten a lot of people on board. Mm -hmm. What I'm having a little bit of a hard time with, though. Is is our our Australian body over there, Dr. Craig Wright? <laughs> um, he's definitely said some crazy things and done some things very antithetical to the entire ideas of liberty and a free, open, and decentralized kind of system. And he's sort of seen as, to a lot of people, the figurehead, or at least one of the main figureheads of yeah. the SV world. Uh, I haven't, as, as that, that's just been an initial easy to see impression. Uh, what are your take? What's your take on him, or why he does or doesn't matter for the SV ecosystem? I I think with Craig, like first of all, Craig is super prickly. Like that's his personality. I, I don't like the way that he talks to people. I even when I disagree with somebody, I, I try to find common mm -hmm. ground and bring. Like I believe everyone has value, uh, but I think Craig's at a point in his life where he is convinced that not everyone has value. <laughs> And, and you know what, maybe he's right. I, I don't really want to comment on, on that per se, but I think like Craig's value is, is what it is to the network. And I think the ethos of the network, if the ethos of the network is, is stuck to, the, the roadmap actually makes Craig um, obsolete long-term because what he's trying to do is create mining competition and he's trying to lock the protocol. So like developer centralization almost always comes from protocol development centralization. So um, he wants to lock the protocol and then incentivize third party app developers and third party miners to basically have to work on SV for, for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of don't care what his politics are. And, and I disagree you know, to a point, like he's kind of a, I think he sees himself as like a Henry Reardon from uh, from Atlas Shrugged. Like he's so he's like kind of a libertarian, but also kind of a dickhead. But that's his that's his persona, and and I think he's playing a role. And but if you look at the incentive of where it's going, I, I it minimizes him long term. Like it does not put him in a permanent bully pulpit. So and and if it does, like if all of a sudden like it does just become Bitcoin Craig long term, like then, I mean, I'm out and a lot of the community's out. So it, I think it really depends. Like the people that are in the SV camp want to see Bitcoin be Bitcoin, but then if it becomes something, I mean, if it becomes something else, I, I just frankly think that they'll be gone. I would be gone. So, mm. I mean, that's the, that's my whole thought on it is like Craig has a role. I'm not asking him to babysit my children. You know, so I kind of, <laughs> I don't care if he's kind of a jerk to, to people he dislikes. It's, I think it's unpleasant. I think it's unfortunate. It's bad PR, but, you know, I, I don't know how much that matters. Well, that sort of rolls into the concept of, it seems like Bitcoin maximalism is about Bitcoin's great. All our coins are shit coins. <laughs> Bitcoin cash, Bitcoin ABC has tended to follow the, Bitcoin's great and will win, but in a much less, much more free market competitive and much less hostile kind of a way. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin SV seems to be, um, see, seems to be 
back to the original Bitcoin maximalism as in a lot of the community, I'm saying it, it's technology, yeah. it's neutral, right? A lot sure. of the community seems to be um, Bitcoin maximalism rebooted on more than just a picogram of Tyrannable, right? It seems like sure. roided out maximalism, destroy all other coins today, not just yeah. call them scams. Sure. And it doesn't seem like that's much your thing. How do you, how do you get along with your fellow SV fans if they seem to want to crush everything and you seem to be a lot more tolerant about that? Um, I like competition. I, I'm a fighter. I, I'm into MMA and I, you know, I, I like, I like strong people to survive. And, you know, I'm a, I'm an egalitarian as well. I, I like people, but what's best for the world and what's best for the network is for the best thing to rise to the top, right? And I don't know what that is. I tend to think it would be Bitcoin SV at this point, but I could be wrong. And if we're all if we're all playing kumbaya all the time, if everybody went, wants to be friends with Vitalik Buterin and everybody, want, you know, we want two thousand coins all out in the universe, like that's confusing. I think it's inefficient, and it's not really what the free market would give us normally. I, I, I had a conversation with Josiah from Digibyte the other day, and we kind of agreed that like long term or mid term that there could be something like five coins because most of them are garbage. Like I, I feel like if we compete, if we actually compete, something like Litecoin rightfully should disappear. And if that happens, good. Or you know, Vertcoin or, or anything else. Like all of these redundant projects, I think it's a good thing. And then I don't if know, we, man. I'm long on Litecoin Cash. <laughs> but then, if we get to a point where, like, I think there will be a major blockchain for just kind of white market commerce. I think there will be a, a dark web king coin. I think there will probably be something that provides like an underpinning to uh, banks and other financial institutions. Maybe that's something like XRP, or, or maybe it's Hyperledger or something. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know that competing to win, like actually competing for the gold is bad for anybody. I feel like we've spent a lot of time sitting back and earning big ass fiat gains. And that that's made everyone lazy from kind of a developmental and adoption standpoint. And if we go that direction, that's good. I think we need to go that direction and, and really burn off a lot of the garbage, frankly. Yeah. I mean, that does kind of that does definitely make sense. Um, right here in New Hampshire, where I go spend crypto all the time, the payment processor is called AnyPay, mm -hmm. except BTC. I think BTC Lightning. I can't tell. Mm -hmm. um, Dash, Bitcoin Cash. I don't think SV yet. Litecoin and Dogecoin. Maybe Ethereum and XRP. Sure. And or um, yeah, I know. I know they, yeah, they Ripple. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah it, a pile. It, and it, they only. And if a merchant gets set up, whatever the merchant has for their like deposit address or whatever, when that gets set up, that enables that one coin. So if you only you can have it as just one taking one coin, or you can add some extra ones. And right. so one thing I noticed is it's pretty universal around. I just go, oh, I pay with Dash, pay with Dash, pay with Dash. It just works. No one ever crosses their eyes anymore. They're very used to it because the vast majority of their payments are under Dash. And then sure. once in a while, you get to like, I do remember one time. Uh, someone tipped a waitress a whole bunch in Bitcoin Cash, mm. and she was trying to pay an invoice at her own restaurant. They couldn't figure it out mm. because she was trying to send to a BTC invoice. And so I said, "No, no, no! Here, let me show you how to switch to the other the other Bitcoin. You're trying to pay Bitcoin with the other Bitcoin, and it wouldn't work because it was uh, she was it was the old address format, the new address format, trying to pay to the old one. It didn't even work. I'm just like." How much how much easier would this lady's life be if she just gotten Dash and just paid in Dash and then it would be it? Sure. And of course, competition's great, but obviously some sometimes competition means some people have <laughs> some people have to fall by the wayside. Yeah. Uh, speaking of fall by the wayside, whew, this has been a crazy year for the markets, hasn't it? Like a whole long year after the after the the Lambo winning of late twenty seventeen. <laughs> And then the, the blood in the streets of now. How do you guys see, what are you guys' general perspectives on the, the market? Um, should be all I, I would say in the short term, 
we're waiting for a bullish movement. And we've been watching this pattern. It's the inverse head and shoulders pattern for about a month now. Like hey, I, heard, I hear Tone Bay say that term too. Yeah, well, because <laughs> everybody could see the same chart. So anybody mm -hmm. that can read a chart is going to see the pattern. And I think the whole market's kind of been waiting on this to play out. And it's been happening for the past since middle of November. So two months now. Um, I think everyone's on edge waiting for it to break out, but there's always that possibility it doesn't. And if we go down, we're probably going to set new lows. Yeah. yeah, so you're kind of expecting another, within another month or two, we should kind of know where we're going from there. Um, I would not say month or two. I would say next week, like within the next week, it should be picking a direction. Otherwise, this pattern is not going to be playing out. Yeah, so there, he has risen or he has wrecked within the week. Pretty much, and it's unfortunately like when Bitcoin goes, they all go. All the USD mm -hmm. value drop at once. So, from a trader's perspective, you got to watch Bitcoin and watch and see what Bitcoin's going to do before you make a decision on the altcoins because usually they're going to follow. Yeah. So has this giant crazy crash been at all? um surprising in any way has it been i mean everyone knew a correction was coming but was this was this uh, an, a level of wrecked that you did not even kind of think was in the books or was it um, like, yeah it was expected <laughs> i think it was expected but not necessarily prepared for um as good as it could have been when the market began to crash in the beginning of the year there was a lot of fud going around with tether and a lot of people didn't want to cash out to Tether because they were scared it was just going to blow up. They didn't want to cash out to Fiat because then there's taxable gains and all that. So they ended up holding. And throughout the year, we've seen all these stable coins pop up. So now we, now we have plenty of options. You don't have to only go in Tether if you think that's you know, going to blow up. But so far, Tether hasn't had any issues, and that's been all FUD. So... The sooner you realize that, hey, I could store my portfolio in stable coins without leaving the market in fiat, I think the 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 more money people ended up with because everyone else held <laughs> and they they just got wrecked this year. Yeah. So with those whole the whole stable coin thing, I've had a I had a hard time for the longest time understanding what the point was, except the whole like tax goal gain kind of thing. It seems like it's a way to be able to lock in your gains without in fiat values without actually having to go through the regulatory burden of converting to fiat. Do you see what what happens if people if the, the government starts to regulate stable coins as fiat they, like side by side the same way? Do you think that would like completely destroy their appeal or is there something else there? Uh, I still think it's easier than going back in and out of fiat, regardless of how the government feels about it. Um, I mean, you're, you you got to pay your tax no matter what. So <laughs> it doesn't matter how the government feels, if it's going to be regulated or not. It's still an easier way to get in and out of actual volatile crypto holdings without going just straight to cash. Because then your bank's going to flag you for doing crypto transactions. And some banks have been shutting people's accounts down for being involved in crypto. So it's a way to get away from that risk. Hmm. Do you think that, so Bitcoin as a store of value has been promised for a while. And of course we've been, yeah, I see Kurt smiling on that one because <laughs> it's like, eh, is it just an excuse to have a product that doesn't work? But yeah, I think it's, that's a bad narrative. What happens when you, do get a store value type crypto or one coin becomes widely adopted widely used enough that sort of like the us dollar becomes a sort of reliable reserve currency you can peg things to and pretty much becomes relatively stable like for example i remember in what was it late 2015 early 2016 around the, around the times of brexit uh, Bitcoin was more stable than the British pound for a, a shining moment in time. Mm -hmm. So what happens in that situation? Does it ever decimate? Does that also 
turn into a situation where now you got a stable coin that is it's basically like a cheap knockoff of the main stable coin that except it doesn't go up in value at all it just only stays I think I'd like to answer because it's kind of an economics question. Like the obviously right now, fiat peg is is the king because that's how we think, and it's because of all the liquidity that exists in fiat. Like that's what keeps it quote unquote stable. But it isn't actually stable. It's losing like two or three percent of its value year to year. Anyways, we just don't perceive it because it's it's slow and and we just think in in dollar value, but if something becomes the the store of value if there's so much volume and liquidity on a coin then that thing will become stable and then i i don't see how that happens without fiat uh being victimized by it and i don't know if it's like chicken and, and an egg situation is is fiat going to collapse and therefore crypto is going to be the solid thing or will uh, the the solid nature of uh, Bitcoin or whatever end up uh, killing fiat itself. So I, I don't know which one kind of precipitates the other, but ultimately, um, I, I think we will get there. And if we don't get there, it's all a you know it was all a dumb experiment, anyways. Then, uh, and I, I certainly hope that's not the case. But uh, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a complicated um, it's a complicated concept. It's a macroeconomic concept that we don't really have a lot of data for like changing mass worldwide currency standards. That's uh, that's, that's a, that's some new, new trails were blazing there. And there's a lot of people dying from dysentery on the Oregon trail in that situation. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, speaking of that whole thing, um, it seems like there's a lot of trading profits to be made on a lot of projects that might not ever have been in the remote zip code of being used in the real world. Sure. So how do you guys feel about um, being at the same <laughs> for again, being theatrical for the sake of for the sake of the video, uh, <laughs> being adoption maximalist, you know, by day and shitcoin peddlers by night <laughs> <laughs> is sort of doing all the, the whole trading game is not for like, Oh, I like these five cause they're going to be adopted and then sure. everything else can go away. It's like, no, it's like, Oh, this one's going to pump. I'm going to put money into that one. I do this, take my gains into that one. Sure. How does that, how, how does that contrast kind of work out? I mean, it, I mean, it's just, it's business opportunity. I mean, if mm -hmm. like, I, I just think frankly, it would be dumb not to like, if you're good at trading, like where else could you have made 20,000% gains in a year? Like that's just, it doesn't exist anywhere else. And therefore, um, you know, just like any other business opportunity, if this was, you know, 1870s and the gold rush was happening, I, I would yeah. put everything into selling pickaxes to speculators. Like that's just, that's business. Like that is, that's the opportunity that's there. And so it, those magic bifocals so you can, yeah, absolutely. See the gold a little bit better. Well, and that's the thing, and and that's kind of part of the reason why we try to be really crystal clear about what makes a garbage coin. I mean, we tell people like this is this is trash. Like, there's yeah, a people know the coins we like long term, and yeah. they know like, hey, this is just a trading opportunity. We get in, we get out, take profits, move on to the next one, or we yeah. stop out and lose. Yeah, but I mean, if if some fool is going to pump a coin, you know, like look at Verge, for example, I talk about Verge as, you know, arguably the worst coin in crypto, not because it's technically the worst, but because it's the, the highest average of really bad technology and really toxic fanaticism and, and, and really high pumps. Yeah. But, but exactly like Verge hits a basic support zone buy some damn Verge because there's a bunch of fanboys who are going to push it up. Five thousand percent, and it, it, like it'd be foolish to not take their money. <laughs> I mean, they're literally, yeah. like, <laughs> and it's just you know, and it's but it's the game. It's the game that we all consent to. Like it's just like consensus. Like you consent to be governed by miners, which sounds junky when your blocks get orphaned or your chain gets reorganized. But that's the game. Like read the rules and play the game. Like I don't play basketball 
with the Chicago Bulls because they will steamroll me. But that's that's basketball. I don't deserve to play that game if I can't compete. And yeah. I think trading is is exactly that. Like if there's an opportunity there, it's everybody knows. Everybody knows you can lose, and most people do. And the people that know how to play the game right, if you play it systematically and conservatively, there's a lot to be made there. So, yeah, so in in essence, you're taking getting a lot of money from taking trash and using it to buy DAS. So in a, in a sense, you're recycling, right? <laughs> yeah. Now you have a recycling <laughs> business. <laughs> Precisely. So it, everyone was a genius crypto trader in 2017, like just the best. There was just such a boom of genius, amazingly talented traders <laughs> who literally just, you know, they, they bought any kind of crypto and moved around a little bit and they made tons of money because the whole market was going up. Sure. Ha, has that really been at all possible on the crash? Have there been people who've managed to increase their net worth during that time or at least kind of slow, kind of kind of managed to have a much higher net worth than they otherwise would have without just throwing it all into tether back in uh, January of this year, this last year? I think, uh, you know, be, being short, like obviously it's easier to make money on hype. The, the bulls mm -hmm. are are crazier than the bears, but uh, I should let Matt walk you through some of the, you know, some of our big gains in 2018. There's been a yeah. few times there's been easy ways to make money. Yeah. And in 2018, it was certainly not as easy as 2017 because in 2017, people were just buying and holding and eventually it would pump. Uh, a lot of them wanted to take profits and they held all the way back down. Um, some, but, a lot of people did make uh, really big gains. This year, the key was taking those gains and storing them in something stable. So there were certain times the year we had altcoin signals on Binance, but Bitcoin was going down months after. So you take the profits and you move them in something stable and you're able to hold your gains. The problem people have is they have the Bitcoin as a store of value and they don't look at the charts, they don't understand, and they'll just hold it for 80% losses and they lose everything. Wow. That's um, losing everything. I'm sure that's a narrative we hear plenty of times over. But... Oh, I know people have lost everything. There's We have 50,000 people in our group and the overall sentiment is very, very depressed and negative right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's just sort of like the uh, the big big connect subreddit right before they locked it, and made it private. That was that was a source of comedy gold at the same time as like genuine human compassion for oh, yeah. for the less well, fortunate. In in the beginning of the video, you mentioned this uh, what was happening with Brenna Sparks, how she was having mm -hmm. a ton of people attack her. Well, do you think that would happen in a bull market? Probably not. It's because people have all held all year long and rid the market all the way down. Now they're pissed off and trolling and you know talking crap to everybody else in the community yeah yeah there's a well yes and no yes there's definitely more of a bitter sentiment and i do notice some people that are just get start talking uh, any kind of smack about people like myself people in the dash core team developers there are always a few that just start to be like well why are we even paying these guys and then the next day there's a bounce and then they're all smiles and all right. Like, oh, goodness. But at the same time, this has been relatively a good season for, with the exception of like the last month, pretty much, for Dash being not trolled on too hard. It just <laughs> everyone was too busy, you know, crying into their beer that they wish they bought from Monero and just not just too busy suffering to really care it's just when it's up they're always trying to like knock down the hype train to get ahead when everyone's right. when everyone's getting wrecked sometimes there's not it, it's maybe a little bit more general general bitterness and mm. not so much targeted ulterior motive bitterness sure i don't think anyone in our group has bashed dash ever and everybody really likes very dash. bizarre everybody really <laughs> likes dash because they actually worked really hard in this bear market no matter what you did what your project did you 
highly unlikely you were green on the year. The whole market got sucked down, but there was really only a few that stood out that really pushed out updates and made further progress, and Dash was one of them. Yeah, well, that's, um, it's good to see other people recognize it. Sometimes it's shouting into, into the abyss, mm. but that's why I have such a booming deep voice now is because I've been so <laughs> practicing just shouting into, into as they call it, CT or crypto Twitter yeah. over and over <laughs> about, why are you forgetting this? Well, yeah. that has been quite the enlightening chat. Thanks very much for coming on. Uh, how are people who are so inclined to get in on your, your trading goodness and your recycling business? Um, <laughs> where, where, where should we send them? Where do they go? CryptoTradersPro.com. Uh, CryptoTradersPro.com is the kind of the central hub of our universe, and from there you can link to our YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us on Facebook, which is uh, where we have the largest uh, segment of our community. We've got about 50k people on Facebook. Uh, it's a, a heavily moderated group. We don't let any spammers, scammers. It's not going to be anybody dropping referral Are you links. Sure, you're not famous. <laughs> just kidding. Had to drop. Had to drop that in there. You know what, and, and I think that's actually a good point too, is we get a lot of people, you know, with this bearish sentiment, a lot of people, like, we've received death threats quite plainly. And, you know, we're, I tell everybody, like, I have never banned anybody for disagreeing. Like even, like we can talk for eight hours about why the other person is wrong, but until somebody mm -hmm. starts, you know, dropping threats or, or like just literally turning into, you know, like, you're just a moron, F you, you know, that kind of like, when it turns into Thunderdome, like that's when people get muted or blocked. Hmm. But, but I mean, we can disagree all day. And, and you know, Matt and I have, have curated a community that, that allows people to have an opinion. Like there are people that I hardcore disagree with, I fight with every day, but I keep them there because the conversation is the thing that has value. And iron sharpens iron. Absolutely. So yeah, people can find us on Facebook. That is definitely our most active community, but we really like people to subscribe to our YouTube channel and, and on Twitter as well. Matt and I uh, personally are on Twitter and we have a business Twitter page as well. Um, but all that can be linked uh, and found at CryptoTradersPro.com. All right. Well, fantastic. And thanks again for sharing your time. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. Likewise. Thanks for having us on.